know better than to say, Sylvia, you made me cry tonight. Because the truth is, you helped me cry. And I love that when I am able to cry, not from sadness, but from anticipation and joy. Not all tears are grieving tears. Sometimes they're mixed in. But I just want to say, I know better than to say, thank you for making me cry. But there's something about the word alleluia. And when we were singing alleluia tonight, even before we sang the old song version, something happened that I, that I yearn for in worship. I went somewhere else. I don't know where. It wasn't away from the world. I felt engaged. I felt in the waiting I had been met. In that place of pure praise, as we were singing Alleluia, I won't even try and sing it, I thought of the angels hovering over a child in a stable who had been waiting, everybody had been waiting for some kind of attention, acknowledgement, vindication, salvation, liberation, whatever word you want to use. And they saw in the child Jesus something that made angels sing alleluia. That's who I heard tonight, angels singing alleluia. Not only Gloria and Excelsis Deo, but just plain old with a Texas accent, hallelujah. And that's what I hope our whole Advent season can be for us. We're waiting, we're waiting, but it's also happening already. What we long for, what we wait for, is already present to us. Sometimes waiting is valuable. I never feel like it when it's happening, ever. But waiting for God is not like waiting for a train. Because when you wait for a train, you just never know if it will come. But when you're waiting for God, it's not passive waiting for something to happen externally by someone else's agency. Waiting for God is active. It's participatory. It's alive. It's hard to feel impatient when you're waiting for God because God is already there with us. Now, I want to talk tonight about a very impatient person, the original VIP, very impatient person. I know that <clears throat> there may be others in the room who might qualify for that distinctive title of VIP. But tonight I want to talk about John the Baptist, but he is not the only impatient person. I was thinking today as I read the scripture over about another impatient person. And I asked Jerry if he could find this little clip for me, and he did, because he's brilliant. So, meet another very impatient person. I know you're asking today, how long will it take? Somebody's asking, how long will prejudice blind the visions of men? I come to say to you this afternoon, however difficult the moment, Yes, sir. However frustrating the hour, it will not be long no, because truth crushed earth will rise again. Yes, sir. How long, not long, yes, sir. because no lie can live forever. Yes, sir. How long, not long, yes, sir. because you shall reap what you sow. Yes, sir. How long, How not long? long. How long? Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yes, sir. Yet that scaffold sways the future. Yes, Behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. How long? Not long. Because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yes, sir. How long? Not, Not long. long. Not long. Because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yes, sir. He's trampling out the village where the grapes of wrath are stored. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
He's loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. Yes, his sir. truth is marching on. Yes, yes, sir. He has sounded forth the trumpet that shall never call retreat. Yes, he is tipping out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Yes, sir. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Yes. Glory, hallelujah. Yes, sir. Glory, hallelujah. How long, not long, how long, not long, long, how long? What is it that you're waiting for? How long have you been waiting? How motivated are you to wait? What needs to change in order for you to experience what you're waiting for? I was chagrined and chastened by Todd Scoggins' Facebook page post today uh, in which he described being at the gym with his partner, Paul, and wondering whether New Year's resolutions had more effect in Advent than they do in January. And I was only chagrined because I realized I've been making a long list of things I, wanna, I want to have happen, but I'm willing to say, oh, after Christmas, after Christmas. And the truth is, if it's worth waiting for, it's worth happening now. If it's worth waiting for, don't put it off. Find that impatient part of yourself that isn't content to put it off and put it off and put it off for a more opportune time. This is what Martin Luther King said in his letter from the Birmingham jail some years before this speech, when he was told that his protests in Birmingham were untimely, that he should wait longer. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I've never yet engaged in a direct action movement that was well-timed according to the timetable of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait it rings in the ear of every Negro with a piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. Wait, waiting for God, waiting, waiting. I think there is value in waiting because there can't really be incarnation without some kind of gestation. Still, if we wait too long, it might be too late. Advent is a time of waiting and wanting and experiencing the future in the present. We don't read these ancient prophecies or listen to modern prophets describe a world that cannot be or a life that we can't have. We listen with hope that what we hear about we can make happen here and now. I don't know about you, but I'm not willing to wait until the life to come for complete salvation, complete liberation, my glorified body, whatever it is. I'm not willing to wait till it's over in order to experience what we're supposed to experience now. That doesn't mean that all results are instantaneous and that hard work isn't required spiritually, socially, politically. But I have to believe that there's something worth waiting for, and I'm going to live to see it as well. In my own life, in the world, pick your arena. One of my favorite poets, Adrian Rich, talks about waiting during the winter. The work of winter starts fermenting in my head, how with the hands of a lover or a midwife to hold back till the time is right, force nothing, be unforced, accept no giant miracles of growth by counterfeit light, trust roots, 
allow the days to shrink. Give credence to these slender means. Wait without sadness and with grave impatience. Wait without sadness and with grave impatience. Sometimes I feel more capable of that than others. But one reason God gathers us into spiritual community is that it's more satisfying to wait with others than it is to wait in solitude. When we wait together, the process becomes more enlivening. Just the process of being in a spiritual community makes the waiting worth it. We're not waiting for something that we can't have or will never see. John the Baptist is a person who understood what it meant to wait, to be so impatient that people sometimes couldn't endure to be around his impatience. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is in Matthew 3, 1 and 2. So the first phrase, in those days, John the Baptist. Who? John the Baptist. I always wondered about that. As a Catholic growing up, I thought, but we call him John the Baptist. He's not a Baptist, he's a Catholic. <laughs> John the Baptist. Well, it referred to a practice that he engaged in so frequently that people gave him this nickname, John the Baptist. It meant that he took an ancient ritual, the mikvah, the immersion practice of Judaism that women went through before marriage, before, after childbirth, on a monthly basis, that women and men who converted to Judaism went into the waters to have a new beginning. He took that practice and said, let's apply it not to our ritual life, but to our spiritual life. You want to start over? Come to the water with me and let me accompany you under the water till you have an experience of coming up out and gasping for breath and feeling in your body that you had a new beginning, a new life. It was a kind of a quirky practice, and it wasn't customary to apply it in the way that John the Baptist did, not in a temple, but outdoors. And to make it radically, promiscuously available so that anyone who wanted to make a new beginning could go under the waters with John the Baptist. That's how he got his name. And he appeared not in the center of town, but in the wilderness of Judea, so that people had to go and seek it out. And the wilderness, always in the Bible, when the wilderness word appears, it means the untamed place, the unbridled place, the unfettered place, the place that isn't domesticated, the wild place, the place where anything can happen. If you need anything to happen, go to the wilderness, and God will meet you there and make it happen. And this is what he proclaimed. You know, we don't really have a lot of sermons from early Christian leaders. We barely have any of Jesus's. We have very few of other Christian leaders, the actual texts. That's because preaching was spoken, not written. But this is one early sermon that we have. It was Christianity in a phrase. Repent, which just means make a change. Turn around. Change direction. Do it differently. The word simply means do it differently. Try a different perspective. It's a physical change. It means turning around. Now, if you grow up hearing the word repent, not as an invitation, but as a condemnation, they weren't reading from the right Bible. Repent is an invitation to change your perspective. That was, that's Christianity in a phrase from one of the earliest proponents, the first preacher, John the Baptist, even before Jesus was preaching it, was preaching this. Repent, 
for the kingdom of heaven, whatever it is you long for, your utopian vision, your dream come true, it's near. It's not far. It's not at the end of your life. It's not in some other place where you can't reach it. It's nearby. You just have to change your perspective. That was what John the Baptist went around talking to people about. And it had broad appeal. He didn't say, wait, 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 wait. He said, now, 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 now. Near, 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 near. Not far, far, far. Now. Change. Now. Don't wait. We don't even have a clear blueprint for our revolution, he could have said. But we're not going to wait till we have it strategically mapped out in order to live it first. Repent, make a change, try something different. Change your perspective, change your body, change your spirit. Repent. And then Matthew says this about Isaiah, about Matthew. I'm sorry, about John the Baptist, quoting the prophet Isaiah. This is the one of whom Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of God, make straight his pathways. When people heard John the Baptist invite them to make a change now, the ancient words that they grew up hearing but had ceased to have meaning for them all of a sudden came alive. And it wasn't just something they heard about in Sabbath school, but something that stirred in them a desire to make it happen here and now. Not history to be revered or a future to be put off, but here and now. Prepare the way. Make God's paths straight. Okay, not my favorite verse, but <laughs> what that meant was if there's a circuitous way, make it simpler. Make it direct. You know, the shortest distance between two points is never the way a Christian takes <laughs> in their spiritual liberation. We make it harder than it's supposed to be. John the Baptist said, don't do this and this and this. Go for it directly. You don't have to manipulate. You don't have to bargain. You don't have to beg. Go there, and it's yours. Now, here's the part I love about John the Baptist. John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. I've been working in Berkeley, California at a university for the last several years, and I had the darndest time convincing students that there was anything unusual about John the Baptist <laughs> in regard to clothing, self-appearance, or diet. But in a general way, these details about John the Baptist are meant to call attention not to how he's like the expected messenger, but rather to what a nonconformist he was. Because sometimes in order to listen for the prophetic word that calls us into the present, we might have to be willing to listen to someone who doesn't look like they, we think they should look or who doesn't eat the things that we eat, or who doesn't wear the kinds of clothing we might wear. Those things are important to us, but not that important to God when God wants to make a point. Sometimes even God chooses unlikely messengers in order to get our attention, knowing that we have a capacity to disregard what is new or challenging or unconventional, or not how we've always done it. God used John the Baptist, the original hippie, to say, people, people, we don't have to live like this anymore if we don't want to. And something 
about it spoke to their spiritual condition. The people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him in all the regions along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. He spoke to the modern sensibility at that time, and I think he speaks to us too. Christmas is partly about waiting for the word being made flesh in the child Jesus, born in poverty. And Christmas is about the word being born in our flesh, not only about the child, but about us too, and about whatever it is we need to change in order for a new birth to happen. Now, here's where John the Baptist reveals his less than diplomatic skills and maybe his imperfect, impatient character. So zealous was he for other people to experience what he experienced when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming, he said to them, so Pharisees and Sadducees, religious people, okay? Pick what it meant, varying degrees of interpretation. You could make modern analogies to different kinds of denominations. He saw evangelicals and Catholics coming for baptism. He saw charismatics and Episcopalians. He saw Assemblies of God people and Church of Christ coming to him. And what did he say? Welcome. No, he said, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Actually, he had. Who warned you? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. So this is why you don't really want John the Baptist at your dinner party. He doesn't have good manners in the conventional sense or any sense. Plus, he might prefer locusts and wild honey to whatever else you had prepared. But he wasn't afraid to speak a truth if he felt it would help someone achieve their liberation. So he particularly, though he appealed to religious people, he also warned them. There's something about the habit of religion that can stamp out the, lo the life of spirituality. And so he said to them, be careful, religious people, if you take this in, because even your religion is going to look different if you really embrace the invitation that I'm making to you. And that's what I believe was most important to him, though he didn't say it in a diplomatic way. He cared deeply that they experience transformation and that they didn't wait too long and too late. Our spiritual lives, there's nothing more important. I believe that. Do what you need to do in order to make Christmas not about back then, 2,000 years ago only, or the best Christmas ever 50, 30, 20, 10 years ago, but to make the Word being made flesh in us real, here, present, now. Don't even let religion that has disappointed you deprive you of new birth. I've been reading this book, Leaving the Rest, Gay Men on Alcoholism, Addiction, and Recovery. And I loved one particular short story about a person who found an unlikely prophet, not John the Baptist, not Martin Luther King, encouraged in his 12-step program to find a God that meant something to him so that he could experience a breakthrough spiritually. He pretended to sort of go along with the usual conventional religious language. One evening, that all changed. He said, I was walking home listening to Dolly Parton, I've always loved Dolly. She's always inspired me. Her laughter has always made me laugh. I admired her deep faith and her sincere humility. And then he said, I realized, he said, I wish Dolly Parton could be my higher power. And a voice said to him, go ahead. She's yours. And he decided that Dolly Parton was his higher power. 
And yet as crazy, and I'm quoting him now, and yet as crazy as it all sounded, it made sense and suddenly all of it, all of it began to make sense and align. A God of our own, a God of our understanding, a God of our own understanding. This is what it says, right? My sponsor's higher power was a tree. Why couldn't I have Dolly? I understand Dolly Parton. She is a big-hearted, carefree, wonderful woman. I could talk to her. I could tell her anything, couldn't you? Moreover, wouldn't, couldn't you tell Dolly Parton? She will listen and she will not judge. She will accept and she will understand. She will love and she loves freely and she will love generously. She won't shake a finger. She'll listen. She'll hear your every word. I wanted a God I could sit and have a cup of coffee with. That's what I found. That's what I received. And I said, thank you. Mind you, for the record, I understand that Dolly Parton is not God. For me, I suppose she is a kind of prophet. What did I, what I tell Dolly, she shares it with God or something I really don't know. I haven't spent too much time worrying about how the system works. I'm just an alcoholic. I'm not a theologian. <laughs> and here's what I want to say to you. Whether you hear it from Dolly Parton or whether you hear it from the prophet Isaiah or whether you hear it from John the Baptist or whether you hear it from Jesus, Listen, listen, listen to the voice that is calling to you that says, make a change. What you long for is near. And wait long enough for you to imagine it, but don't wait so long that it becomes a lost hope. When? Very soon. Very, very soon. Amen. Soon and very soon.